here. All right, we are recording. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. All right, welcome everyone to the uh, latest monthly uh, virtual installment of the EFF Austin Meetup. My name is Kevin Welch. I am the current president of the board at EFF Austin. We have a lot of first time comers tonight and um, we've been doing these virtual events uh, since COVID began and you have already helped us make this our biggest, most successful one yet with almost 40 people in the room now and still trickling in at a pretty steady rate. So uh, we really wanna thank you all for uh, spending your Tuesday evening with us. For, so for this huge number of new people, you're like, okay, well, I know either who Michael and Caroline are, or hey, I heard about this really cool sounding talk, but who the hell is EFF Austin? Um, EFF Austin, as you might gather from the name, is an Austin-based, uh, in Austin, Texas, I need to clarify that since we're international tonight, Austin-Texas-based digital civil liberties organization. We're closely affiliated with a group called Electronic Frontier Foundation out of San Francisco. For our non uh, U.S. visitors, Electronic Frontier Foundation is one of the, uh, if not the foremost, uh, digital civil liberties advocacy organizations in the United States. You can roughly think of them as the American Civil Liberties Union with a special focus on the internet and emerging technologies. They fight for things like uh, net neutrality, end-to-end -end encryption, uh, freedom of expression under embattled regimes, protection of Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, and just in general, trying to make emerging technological spaces where people's rights to free speech, free expression, privacy, and you know, to live their lives fully are respected in emerging technological spaces. I like to say that we believe that technology should serve people, not the other way around. Um, so yes, EFF has been around for, this is actually their 30th anniversary. It is actually coming up on our 30th anniversary as well, because we've been around about as long as they have. Our creation story is intimately tied up in theirs. I'd be happy to tell you more about it another time. Um, but yeah, EFF has an, a group, an organization called the EFA, or the Electronic Frontier Alliance which is a collection of affiliate digital civil liberties groups scattered all over. And it's a non-hierarchical sort of peer-to-peer -peer activism network on these issues. Um, and we, uh, EFF Austin has the uh, distinction of actually being the oldest still existent member of the uh, EFA. Um, I believe EF Georgia is the second oldest uh, from 1996. But there are now at this point, I believe, over 100 organizations throughout the United States and several internationally who are now members of the EFA. Um, what is it required to join? Nothing really except these issues are important to you and you'd like to start an org where you live. Or maybe you already have an org where you live and are just now hearing about the EFA. So um, you, if you Google um, Electronic Frontier Foundation, Electronic Frontier Alliance, you can get information about how you can let the organizers there know that, hey, I would like to join the Alliance and coordinate in activism with you. It's a really awesome group of people uh, fighting on very important issues. And I encourage you to get involved if these issues are important to you. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about who we are. Um, we traditionally are primarily compared to, uh, and yes, as one of our attendees said, there's about to be a new chapter opening up in Buffalo, New York from a former attendee of our events here in Austin. See, you know, we're just, we're just spreading and metastasizing our ideas all over the globe. <laughs> but um, so traditionally, unlike EFF, which is primarily lobbied at the federal level on, um, on various pieces of legislation, um, we are primarily an education-based organization just because we have a far more limited budget and resources than EFF. Um, if, you, if your funds are limited, I always will tell you, donate to EFF, they are doing the amazing important work. But if you'd like to learn more about us and potentially have a little funds to donate to our cause, there's our website with our convenient PayPal link right at the top. Um, but yeah, so traditionally we're primarily education-based. We hold monthly meetups on a variety of educational topics and have been doing it for many years. Um, traditionally they're held in downtown Austin at Capital Factory, which is kind of our local startup incubator. Um, the guy who runs it is a former board member of ours and graciously lets us run our meetups there free of charge because he believes in our values and our mission. Since COVID, we've been running these things pretty much entirely virtually through a Zoom room Cap Factory has provided us. We probably over the next several months are going to try to explore as the local conditions allow, trying to start doing in-person things again. 
Um, that being said, we're also going to try to explore continuing to have the Zoom room as an option for people because we've really enjoyed the broader scope of speakers and visitors that we can bring in via the internet. So we're going to try eventually here to get a best of both worlds sort of situation. So stay tuned on that. As for upcoming talks, um, I now know tentatively what our June talk is going to be. And specifically, the time of these talks is currently the second Tuesday of every month at 7 p.m. And you can learn more about upcoming events on our numerous social media channels. For those of you who are not on social media for privacy concerns, meet up may be a decent way to know what we are up to. We also, though, for those who uh, are on social media but uh, do not like Facebook for very, very good reasons, we also have a Twitter account that you can follow. In fact, let me uh, grab that for you here for a link. Uh, well, I'll post that in the chat in just a second. But, and then finally, we're on Facebook as well. We have a page and a group you can follow. But uh, for next month's event, um, I haven't yet made the announcements, but we're probably going to be having um, Carrie, who's the director of the City of Austin's Innovation Office, coming and talking to us about a project they're working on called Life Files, which is an attempt to make it easier for those experiencing houselessness to retain copies of their identification and digital documents, since the houseless are very much prone to having these lost or stolen and can have vital social services denied to them without these documents. So this is their attempt at a solution. We've been consulting with them to make sure that this is a solution that involves actually speaking with the houseless to make sure it privileges their needs, as well as protecting people's privacy and people's data and giving the users of the app autonomy over it. So if this sounds like a topic that is interesting to you, we encourage you to come out next month. Um, beyond that, we also have been known to occasionally throw very fun cyberpunk parties. So if you ever find yourself Austin way, we may be throwing one, you might wanna check it out. In fact, Michael and Caroline, we first met and they spoke at one of those parties a few years ago and they were a hoot. Um, also, um, we tend to do a bit of activism rabble rousing both at the city and the state level. Uh, first, a little taste of some city level rabble rousing activism we're doing. We are a collaborator on a campaign EFF is running called About Face, but we are trying to get a ban on the use of public facial recognition in Austin, Texas, particularly on the part of law enforcement. So. Um, Certainly, uh, if you have friends who live in Austin, we would certainly appreciate it if you share it with them and get them to sign it. More signatures equals more traction on getting our local elected leaders uh, and people to care and pay attention. So that's one thing we're working on right now. We also have been tracking various bills before the Texas Ledge this session. Uh, one of our board members, David Hensley, did a very good write-up on a lot of the bills at the beginning of the session. Um, I'm sharing his write-ups with you here. Many of those bills at this point have, are, are dead and have not made it through the legislative process, but it's still a good taste to know some things that were in the pipeline, especially because there are still several bills that last I checked were still making it and are very concerning. One uh, involves creating essentially a database of every woman in Texas who has sought abortion services, which yes, if you're like, yikes, yes, that was my reaction. There have also been a number of other really uh, scary, really horrifying ones that have been making it very far in the process. So if you're at all based in Texas, you might wanna consult that list, see which of those bills are still out there and around and uh, let your legislators and committees know because uh, you know this, uh, this is why we're here trying to be a watchdog because there's always some new law uh, being passed by politicians who do not always understand or appreciate the implications of technology. And part of what we're here to do is to try to educate them on those issues. Um, let's see, any final things we're working on right now? Oh yes, um, we also have a one-sheeter we're circulating that I will drop into the chat in a little bit here, but it's a current proposal from the EFF Austin board to try to solve some of the current problems uh, with social media. We're basically trying to get some momentum behind essentially trying to turn social media 
into a federated technology, much the way email is, so that there would be a standard API that would let you move your data and your friends and your account between different social media companies. And therefore, much like you can choose to use Thunderbird or Gmail, but you can still email everyone because it's a standard federated protocol, we're hoping to try to get some traction and do the same thing for social media. So. We're you know, currently trying to find interested politicians who might like to uh, introduce the legislation and create working groups to start hammering it out. But we have a one sheeter on the topic that I will share in the chat in a bit. And you can share with anyone who you think might indeed agree that this would be a good movement to get behind. All right, I think I've talked about us enough and I've mostly talked about all our current ongoing initiatives. So before I introduce our speakers, I'm gonna quickly ask the room if there are any announcements that you, you would like to share with us. Um, a shameless self-promotion is totally okay, as long as you think it would be of vague interest to the people in this room and the digital civil liberties community, or just, you know, the, the geek community, the futurist community, the law, the tech community, the cyberpunk community, what have you. If you think uh, we'd be interested in it, I'd love to hear about it. Um, so we don't have anarchy, I would ask you to either type in the chat or raise your hand. We normally don't have quite this many people, but um, does anybody have anything they'd like to share with the room while I'm briefly giving them the floor? It's fine if the answer is no, but we always like to check. I'm looking for hands just in case. All right, everybody seems good. That being said, you know, feel free to circle back around to this if you think of something later. Okay, so without further ado, I am going to introduce our two speakers for the evening. And I pretty much will just be uh, reading the bios they gave me verbatim. Um, I, the only thing I will just add is that I uh, think my and Caroline are both very wonderful people. Um, I got the pleasure of getting to know them when they were at our EFF Austin event uh, here a few years ago. Uh, they met one of our board members, Heather Barfield, at an academic conference, and she thought they would make wonderful speakers for one of our South by Southwest parties, and I'm so glad she made the connection and facilitated them joining us. They have also, uh, they're some of the rare privileged people who have seen the inside of my house and know all the skeletons in my closet, so there's that too. <laughs> but um, uh, to give you their official bio, Michael Running Wolf was raised in a rural village in Montana with intermittent water and electricity with grandparents who only spoke their tribal languages, Cheyenne and Lakota. These languages, like many other indigenous languages, are near extinction. It is through this lens, combined with his master's of science in computer science and professional experiences with Amazon, IBM, AT&T Wireless, and Lawrence Livermore National Lab, that he found his true passion endangered indigenous language revitalization using XR, AR slash VR technology. Michael now works, in, works to strengthen the ecology of thought represented by indigenous languages through the intersection of virtual augmented reality and artificial intelligence. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, and then finally, uh, for Caroline, Caroline Running Wolf, and I'm not 100% sure how to pronounce your uh, last name there, Caroline. Do you want me to attempt it, <laughs> or should I go on? All right, I'll give it an attempt, but correct me later. Um, so, um, Caroline Running Wolf, at Nasaluk, Ne Old Coyote, is a multilingual cultural acclamation artist dedicated to supporting indigenous language and culture vitality. She is currently pursuing her PhD in anthropology at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Her research explores potential applications of immersive technology, AR, VR, XR, and artificial intelligence to effectively enhance indigenous language and culture reclamation. She is also passionate about indigenous data sovereignty and AI ethics. Now, to give just a quick little intro what they're going to be talking to us about before I turn things over to them, this is going to be a talk that is going to be an introduction to the intersection of revitalizing sacred knowledge through new media and exploitation of this data. For centuries, indigenous peoples of the Americas have resisted the loss of their land, technology, and cultural knowledge. This resistance has been enabled by vibrant cultural protocols unique to each tribal nation, which controls the sharing of and limits access to sacred knowledge. Technology has made preserving and presenting this information in new ways easy, but there is a tension between reigniting ancient knowledge and mediums that allow uncontrollable exploitation of this data. New media opens a new path for revitalizing and sharing heritage, but creating indigenous cultural experiences requires special care 
to avoid exploitative behavior. And to explain what all that means and um, you know, really delve deeply into these issues that many of us may not have thought about before, and I hope we're all gonna learn a lot about tonight, I'm going to hand things over to Michael and Caroline. Well, thank you so much, Kevin, for that introduction. I started sharing the screen and I'm not sure, can you see it? Yay, awesome. So yeah, you already said pretty much everything. So just a quick outline. We're going to do a quick intro of who we are and where we're coming from, and then talk a bit more about indigenous protocols for AI and uh, go into what's next. And we're really excited about the amount of time that the session has, because that means we can have some really great conversations and Q&A, and that's what we're looking forward, for, forward to. So don't expect us to be monologuing here for, for two hours. So uh, you already heard a lot about who we are. Um, so my, my tribe is pronounced Abzaluke. And from my mom's side, I'm German. And uh, my, my expertise background is I'm a former nerd herder and polyglot. And I'm Michael Rodney Wolf, um, the husband, pretty much all you got to say. <laughs> I'm from, so me and Caroline are uh, enemy tribes, and we actually both are stereotypical. Next slide. See, wait for it. And so we're actually the stereotypical feather Indian, so to speak, or Native American. We prefer, uh, it depends on the country. So in Canada, I'm learning the hard way that Native is uh, pejorative. Um, and, and native in the North America, North uh, in the United States of America, um, is okay, but it's not so okay in Canada. So they prefer First Nations. But if you want to be extra careful, which I prefer, you go with Indigenous. And and so we are the stereotypical North American Indigenous the feathers. And and here's a picture of Caroline's um, tribe. Uh, so yeah, so the little triangle is where we are from, roughly. Um, the homelands of the Cheyenne, Lakota, and the Crow, um, even they had a homeland, I suppose that might matter, uh, are anywhere from the Rockies all the way down to Texas and all the way over to uh, the Mississippi. And there's just like the territory of the Plains uh, indigenous peoples. And we are working, we are currently in Vancouver, BC, way over in the, the far corner up there. That little star. orange star. <laughs> yeah, and we're working with, um, We'll talk about it more in the project, but these are the area we're working with on our scientific project to be an automatic speech recognition. Yeah, so uh, you might know it as Vancouver, British Columbia, but it's actually the traditional Coast Salish territories of the Muscom, Squamish, and Solitude First Nations and uh, unceded territory. So what we're talking about and what we've been working towards for the past six or seven years now is um, the stream that we have to build accessible, immersive, indigenous AI technology. And the goal just being to empower the community, build capacity and, and you know, just assist with the communities, the various indigenous communities and their efforts of reclaiming their languages, cultures, identities, worldviews, while using, you know, these, these kind of technologies, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality. Um, yeah, all of that. Uh, and something that Michael likes to point out, I don't know, he's not talking, so I'll just continue, is that all of these basic technologies like like augmented reality um, or virtual reality, machine translation, voice assistance, all of that exists already today, but it does not exist for indigenous languages. And that's kind of where we're at right now is realizing that ASR is the hard part. And so what, what Caroline means is that from a fundamental technical problem perspective, um, VR, AR, uh, experience, these other experiences do exist. They're, they're very 
uh, in the very early stage right now. And then maybe a few, I mean, I don't know, at least another five years before it's uh, more mainstream and, and it's getting cheaper. So when we first started, VR headsets cost around $1,000. Now you can buy one from uh, Amazon or Walmart or uh, Hudson's Bay, I assume, for about three to 400 Canadian <laughs> uh, or 300 US dollars. And uh, But the problem, though, is that we found is that as we were building on this path of we wanted to get the headset, put it on, and have a Lakota experience. So I put it on there. You're talking Cheyenne or you're talking... Tatavian from uh, California, or even Crow, if uh, one wants to denigrate themselves <laughs> to speak that language, or Navajo, put it on and have an interaction and be able to speak your language and have like these uh, gamified experiences where you can interact with your culture and also be able to have like a this fulfilling experience in VR and also in, in a private way so that uh, when you're learning a second language, it's very difficult. And often when the first uh, second language learner, as you're learning the language for the first time, you become shy. And so in VR, it's been shown that it helps people learn German, English, other languages, these primary languages pretty easily because it's immersive. And then also you're not shy because you're just talking to a computer. Uh, but that doesn't exist. The, the fundamental science does not exist for automatic speech recognition. Uh, for instance, the languages of the West in Europe and also in Asia, like uh, in China, are not very polysynthetic. And I have to be very careful with the way I phrase this because I have linguist friends and they, they're probably here in the room. Um, and so what happened is, so I'll just pick on the West and the European, European languages, is that because of an accident of history, uh, languages in, in Europe particularly Western Europe, do not have this feature called polysynthesis. And polysynthesis uh, can be best explained by the compound nouns of German, where you can have like a folk secret high, you know, people's safety. And you see that a lot when you're looking at German signs, like you see these big, huge, long words, and that's a compound noun. And that is weak polysynthesis. For North American languages, the majority of North American languages have this feature where we can take a concept and in linguistic terms, this is called the morpheme, and you can modify that morpheme with other morphemes and other modifiers. And so you can create an infinite amount of words. Uh, and so some languages don't even have nouns per se. They're just entirely verb based, uh, some of the Coast of Salus languages. And what this means is that you can compact uh, the benefit of these languages, you can compact a lot of information. So when I talk about Caroline's cat, for example, I can talk about the vector in which it's hidden, the relative distance to me, its gender, and whether or not I care about that cat, all within one word. And the, 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 the limit to the fact pretty... that it's my cat and not yours. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And so, and then, I, and this is really important. And then it's also very, it's uh, what the other side effect, though, is that a dictionary doesn't make sense because. To have a dictionary, you need to have atomic words. And so English is an atomic language. We just say red car, two separate words, red and car. Uh, and in a North American polysynthetic languages, you may have a the red car that my brother owns that's heading north, you know, that in fast. one word. Yeah, fast, yeah, past tense or present tense, you know, like it all depends. And so the technology assumes that you have a finite dictionary for atomic words. And when you do polysynthesis, when you're talking to a um, uh, automatic speech recognition, for instance, Siri or Google Assistant, and you're, you're saying, you know, like, hey, Siri, turn on my lights. Uh, for polysynthetic languages, you would need to say, hey, Siri, give her the annotate her or conjugate that phrase correctly to Siri, that it's a robot that you don't know and you're definitely not having an affair with <laughs> and turn on the lights that are over there to the north. You know, like and all these things need to be solved. They do not, they actually, it's just in machine learning, it's not been solved. So from, from a fundamental perspective, it's just not been done. Um, and so, and it's really just an issue that Western languages don't have this property. So they never had to solve it technologically. Um, so on this slide, Michael just immediately jumped to the last bullet point, which is it's not English. Um, and he explained to you some of the many ways how uh, North American indigenous languages are not English. There are other challenges, of course, to creating automatic speech recognition for indigenous languages. And uh, the, the biggest ones are the fact that it's low resource and low resource can mean everything from um, 
that there's not a lot of machine trainable audio and, and text corpus, that uh, some tribes don't have that many speakers left or, or maybe even no first language speakers left and only language learners, which is you know, also quite a challenge and, and an obstacle for creating um, machine learning. And even such simple things like electricity, um, and of course, AI technicians and data scientists. So low resource is a big term for, for many factors. And then of course we have um, the factors of competing orthographies or very, very diverse so-called dialects, um, geographical barriers. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. One of the, or two of the projects we're working on, um, they, they have all of these bullet points going for or against them, however you want to see it. So yeah, it's it's quite a quite an issue, and and then on top of it all, polysynthetic, not English. Kind of to bring home to why we're talking about it to you is that in addition to the technological and social problems, we are also facing appropriation. Um, uh, tribes, uh, not the crow, <laughs> are considered sexy and interesting, like the Hawaiians, for example. The crow are sexy too. <laughs> yes, I married one. You married me. <laughs> you won. We're married, by the way, so it doesn't come through. <laughs> uh, and so uh, what happens, though, is that so for a long time since contact, uh, uh, tribes have been facing this problem of having their culture exploited. And for example, like Pocahontas, the true story, like see, see we met uh, John Smith and went to Europe. What happens when she got kidnapped and was put into basically what was called a, a human zoo, her and other people of her tribe and other people of that region. So in Europe, which existed all the way into the 1990s, Europeans would take uh, Native Americans or indigenous peoples from the, and take them to London and have human zoos where people can go over there and look at ooh and ah at the exotic peoples and their primitive savage ways and look at that one's got a funny nose he must be crow <laughs> and so they <laughs> and this actually persisted and this continues um i think neil lawrence who i met at nerps he wrote an amazing uh, little essay in the guardian uh, called uh, the data out oligarchies and of how these large corporations and states are collecting data uh, and for not necessarily nefarious purposes, but for the creating oligarchies of information. And you start seeing indigenous data as a resource. And so if you start seeing, uh, and so we have all this data, cultural knowledge, cultural stories, cultural you know, artifacts, and you have the West entities, be it corporate or private or, or, or state, taking our data our, our cultural information and exploiting it and repackaging it like everyone can go to Hudson's Bay or Walmart and buy a cheap Chinese made trinket, you know, of the, um, the dream catcher. Dream catcher. Is, yeah. Or even like this, um, his pipe. You can tell that uh, whoever wrote drew this cartoon of Peter Pan didn't know what an actual uh, tobacco pipe look like because you can right tell the bat. It seems to be made out of granite. It's like entirely stone, which is entirely wrong. And there is a risk here. Um, if you take indigenous knowledge out of context, it actually can be dangerous. For instance, cocaine, um, or it's a medicine, or like some German, of course, um, Mr. Bear, I think it was, came over there, found cocaine, and said, "Hey, this is kind of cool." And it keeps it kind of affected, and pretty soon you had this whole problem. Uh, of cocaine. And then, of course, the, the worst, worst of that is tobacco. Uh, North America's gift to the world is lung cancer because they took a, Westerners took a medicine, tobacco, and exploited it, maximized it, and is applying it in, in an unhealthy way. And so these knowledge, the, the people, the North American and South American indigenous um, medicine people have decided that we need to protect ourselves against uh, exploitation and cultural appropriation, which is actually dangerous for the world. Um, knowing that there are plants out there that are so dangerous that we shouldn't allow them to escape anymore. And so 
And this is the risk that we're facing as the technology progresses. Originally now, it's just Disney making a cartoon about us, the, the black feet with literal black feet, <laughs> uh, which is harmless in a way. But there's also uh, identifying culture that are intrinsic to the identity of indigenous peoples who are already facing a wealth of uh, socioeconomic problems and then having their cultural stolen and used in a way that denigrates them or lessens their identity. And this is what we're talking about. And so as we as building for automatic speech recognition, we're collecting a lot of audio, collecting and taking in audio from the community with permission, but it's also a lot of sacred information uh, that we're taking in. And so it's important that as we're moving forward with technology, that we're not continuing the same pattern of exploitation, this, uh, this degenerative cycle of steel, 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 and let the, the indigenous survive with the scraps. Um, what we really need, what we're proposing here is a new model of regenerative economics uh, for the community so they can take their information and their, their identities and use it in a way that regenerates the community and contributes to the greater society. Through ASR, the people are contributing their voices to build technology that will benefit science which is humanity and also fellow indigenous peoples who have a polysynthetic language. But anyways, next slide. With, for, and by. Um, so, so this is where we're gonna talk a bit about indigenous protocols for AI, but also just in general, indig indigenous protocols. And, you know, something you have to keep in mind, uh, Michael is uh, kind of hammering it in with the banter between the enemy tribes of Northern Cheyenne and, and Lakota versus Crow, but you know, we're just representatives, two individual representatives of over 600 very, very diverse indigenous nations all across North America. And so um, it's really, it's, it's kind of wrong to say indigenous protocols, but we do realize that there's certain things we have in common. One of them being, you know, we were all colonized by uh, Euro, Euro uh, settlers, uh, colonizers, and we all have that experience in degrees of having our land stolen, our, our women taken, uh, all of these things, you know, and at the same time, there seems to be some common ground on our protocols as well. And, and so some that I picked out is uh, relationality, which means, you know, building, building relationships and not just in, in the case of doing this kind of work, not just helicoptering in, extracting and helicoptering out, but actually building long-term relationships and, um, and doing all of this with respect, utmost respect, always uh, at the foreground of our actions, of our of our thoughts, uh, and one of the ways that respect uh, affects our work is that it doesn't make sense. Like if Michael and me have this awesome idea of what we want to do, and it's not relevant to that community, to that tribe. Um, then, well, too bad, then we, you know, it was a great idea, but if, if it's not relevant to them, it's not going to happen. And it's not our place to push that through or, or to, to, you know, say, but we want this. <laughs> and, um, and then, of course, reciprocity, and reciprocity can have many different ways of, of um, what that could look like. And, and it can mean you know, something as, as, I would say basic, not simple, something as basic as building capacity within the community so that uh, community members can, can start doing their own projects of, of that kind or a similar kind, you know, whether that is teaching them um, how to code or whether it's teaching them how uh, how to use specific software for transcribing, it doesn't matter. And again, it depends on what they want. Like if they say, we want you to teach us uh, how to do 
grant writing, then that's what we're going to teach them. You know, and if they say, we don't want you to teach us anything, we want you to connect us with somebody, then that's what we're going to do. <laughs> um, and so that's a, a, just a little bit of an introduction on on these protocols. And then, of course, always keeping in mind indigenous sovereignty as well, so that nothing we do takes away the IP ownership. Um, and, and, you know, just having that data sovereignty. And it's really important because, especially in that field of AI, where there's, you know, not that many people out there who have that skill and are indigenous at the same time, it's really important to get to get that cohesion in working together and, and making sure, you know, that um, the people, the engineers who, who code and have no idea of the cultural knowledge that, that they can learn to work with the community respectfully and, and to bridge the gap that way. So, yeah. Um, was that me or you speaking? Me? Okay. Um, so the reason why I included this, this picture and the slide is because um, we were, Michael and me, we were invited in March, 2019 to participate in a indigenous protocols and artificial intelligence workshop. And, um, and it, was, it was great for many reasons. And one of them was that uh, we met uh, some Maori ASR activists. And that was kind of, yeah, that moment where for us the fireworks went off because realizing that they managed to create automatic speech recognition for the Maori language uh, with only 300 hours of audio and a very, very good uh, word error rate. So, so it was just like this moment of it's actually possible. We don't need 10,000 hours of data. We don't need to have um, hundreds and thousands of people labeling and, and you know, it's possible we can finally do this. And so um, this, was, this was definitely a game changer for Michael and me um, because not only did we get to meet these people and work with these people, over 35 participants from all over the world. I have this little map here showing where people were coming from, all these different different tribes um, and all of us working together on developing these conceptual and practical approaches to, uh, to building AI systems and infusing them with indigenous knowledge. And yeah, just, just amazing, amazing work. Um, and also we got together in the second workshop as a uh, team prototype. And it was an all indigenous team of language warriors, um, Dr. Noilani Arista and Isaac uh, Ikaaka Naue Peng, where they're both um, fluent in Hawaiian and knowledge keepers. And then Caleb Moses, uh, the data scientist that had worked on the ASR for uh, the Maori project, Joel Davidson, uh, Davison, who's uh, Aboriginal, uh, Dunguti and Gadigal from from the Sydney area in Australia, and then uh, you've already met the two of us, um, and we we use that second workshop as a kind of a hackathon and built this prototype. And I thought I'll just show you the video. Oh dear. Hmm. It's supposed to be here, but it's not. If we're having a technical difficulty, uh, ah. okay. Well, what we'll do is I'll just show it to you later before we start the Q and A. Sorry. Um, yeah. 
no worries. Um, I think that that might be easiest. So we'll show you the video later. It's just a it's just a cute little video introducing the app and what it does. And um, yeah, and this was how we got started. But now it doesn't want to do anything anymore. Huh? There we go. So inspired by by those amazing accomplishments by our uh, Maori friends, we then applied for for an NRC National Research Council of Canada grant and uh, started working with the uh, Kwakwala language um, three, four communities speaking the Kwakwala language up on the North Vancouver Island with that goal of, of creating automatic speech recognition. And, and it was, well, I think it kind of hammered home that recognition to that corpus collection in the traditional way that usually people approach it is a very, very tedious and very slow process takes a lot of work and i i forget i know sean is in the audience and he might tell you more later maybe to um, maybe to back up a bit caroline you, you, i think you guys yeah. were off kilter from the network um okay so what what we happened was that we're at the ip ai indigenous protocols ai conference we we met the maori and which we'll talk about a little bit uh, soon here but they had built the automatic speech recognition for their language or their particular related. Uh, there's a family of Maori languages. There's not just one Maori. There's another monolithic language uh, family. Uh, there's a, it's a family of languages, and one community, Maori language community, uh, wanted to reclaim their own language to make sure it wasn't taken over by the mythical monolith uh, Maori language. And they built it using only 300 hours of annotated audio which is basically a miracle with, at the time, 85% word error success. Uh, uh, were there a rate, 15% uh, were there a rate. So basically 85% of the time they had uh, it returned back accurately. And this is false positives and, um, and false, false negatives, but recognizing correctly, basically. Uh, those are scientific terms, Sean Sosier, ML scientist can explain them better. Uh, we'll bring them, you can ask him those questions, but basically it was uh, very successful with relatively low data. You can go back. Okay. Um, <laughs> and so inspired by that, we said, hey, this is cool. I talked to my friend, Sean Sosi, who's in the audience and said, we should do this for an indigenous language. What we need to do is our North American language. Uh, we need a language that is well documented, uh, and it also needs to have a lot of audio data uh, documented, as in linguistically documented. There's a, there's research papers and the structure and the grammar of the language has been documented, and unfortunately, a lot of languages are not. Uh, North America initially had around 7,000, anywhere from 6,500 to 7,000 distinct languages, and we now currently only have 550 and dwindling. And of those 550 languages, only a handful, or maybe in the hundreds, have the documentation of some sort, have the orthography and alphabet and the language documented and the grammar, structurally grammar. So we needed to filter down the languages and make it as easy as possible because this is cool. This was an entirely all indigenous tech team, the Maori data scientists and the Maori software engineers built their own system. And so we can do that. I know someone smart. I know Caroline. <laughs> and and I, I used to work for Amazon Alexa. And I know how she works. I mean, what she what she does, we can't use, obviously, because they require a lot of data, like millions of hours of annotated data. But 300 is tractable. So we begin this process. And we arrived at uh, Caroline's uh, PhD uh, advisor was working with the Kwakwala languages and the Kwagyu. Am I saying that correctly, Caroline? Is the specific? Yeah, that's one of that's one of the communities, the Kwagyu. Um, and but and yeah, so basically we, the Kwakwakiwa people. And so the reason why we chose that language is it's one of the it's one of the if not the most polysynthetic language in the world. 
um, definitely in North America. And next slide, this is where you go. And expanding upon this early work, we then applied for an MIT grant. So we, we got funded recently, hooray, uh, by the Smith Foundation and the McGowan Foundation and MIT and Sloan and a few other donors that donate to MIT Solve. Uh, Massachusetts Institute of, Technology, Institute of Technology, we created the International Waukesha AI Consortium because the Kwakwala language is part of the Waukesha language family, which is goes from all the way from the most Western point in the lower 48, which is um, Port Hardy or Nia Point, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm landlocked. Yeah, not landlocked. <laughs> so there's like a creek and there's a river and a lake. That's all we have. We don't have points, bays, <laughs> or any of the air, pute sounds uh, in Montana. Um, we have streams. <laughs> Stick to the, to the rivers. Anyways, um, so. So this language uh, uh, comes from all the way from Washington and goes all the way up into northern um, uh, northern Vancouver Island. And so you got so we work working with the Kwakilo, with Sarah Child, and Maria Pascal of the Macaw. And what we're working on now is the scientific and gender, and alongside Connor Quinn, uh, our our pocket linguist, our pet linguist. Actually, we're probably his pets, quite frankly. <laughs> we're implementing his theories of being able to reawaken languages. I, I, I encourage you all to look up Connor McDonald on YouTube, which is actually how we found him. And Caroline has an amusing story we can talk about in the QA. Um, and, but we were a nearly entirely indigenous uh, community uh, a team. And we're working to solve this problem of building polysynthetic as ASR because we're working on the most polysynthetic languages in uh, North America. And our goal is that once we solve this technical problem, we can scale this across the, the, the breadth of North America, because we all have the same technical challenge. And there's a few others on this journey with us. We're not the only people doing this research. There's Seneca researchers, there's the Mohawk researchers, and of course, the Maori, and, and then they took up in, in Canada, and which leads us to the Maori. And there's, they have this a uh, wired article. Uh, so these who we're talking about, these amazing article. Can you copy paste that into the chat, Kira? Um I was hoping, are they here? Is Peter? I, I don't know. I looked earlier. I couldn't see them. Ah. What are you doing? Try to copy paste off the slide. That doesn't work. Oh, yeah, you can't do that. It's a picture. <laughs> <laughs> so what you can, well, uh, we'll put the paste in the slide once we figure it out. Um, and so what they're doing is the, the the summary of this is that there are large corporations that we have technology sitting in our pockets right now and probably at your computer right now who are exploiting the Maori. Like we said earlier about cultural appropriation, Maori is a, uh, is a valuable language from an intellectual property standpoint. And it's an interesting language and People want to learn Maori. People want to do their search in Maori. People want to talk to their phone in Maori. And large corporations want to uh, exploit that. It's marketable, it's commercial. And these people, these individuals, indigenous Maori, who are building their own ASR says, screw that. We are going to build it ourselves. We're going to own the data from ground up. And we're going to make sure that whatever we do empowers the community. And so what they're doing is they're teaching themselves AI, uh, so the community themselves understands what artificial intelligence is, and they're building their own access protocols and protecting the knowledge for themselves. And it's not, and it's like the perfect model, uh, honestly. If you're talking about, well, how do we indigenous communities do it? And this is the way. This is the the, uh, but unfortunately, that's it, it's difficult. Um, not everyone is Maori. <laughs> Not all of us are as cool as they are. Uh, and so what we need to do are build cooperatives and collectives and alliances between our tribes because we do have technical capacity. I am a Cheyenne and Lakota software engineer who knows how to work with big data. And, uh, and I have a Navajo friend who's a got a PhD from Santa Cruz, who's a machine learning data scientist. And we work in with a specific community because we have a objective to broaden and scale this technology. And so we need to operate as a collective community, as indigenous communities together. 
And what does that look like? It's, it's a complex problem. Um, the fundamental problem of why our intellectual property is being exploited is honestly a PhD paper into uh, world trade law and how uh, Western intellectual property has been set up since the Magna Carta, like literally the Magna Carta has set this precedent um, for how indigenous peoples are being violated. But just in short, uh, community knowledge of indigenous is considered public domain. So what that means is that if you have a group of people, like three or four, or maybe even 10 indigenous people, and they sing a song together, that is considered public domain. So you say a big tech can come in with a recorder, record a song from James the Delorma's community, and hopefully I read, said that correctly. And they, the way the IP system works is that whoever makes the recording of public domain information, which is indigenous knowledge, owns the information. So they come in, they record Maori data, they put it into their databases, uh, their S3 buckets or their Firebase database, that's theirs now. Uh, they, they own the audio, they own the, 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 because they own the conveyance of the system. And so what you really need are policy, like the true solution won't ever happen, quite frankly, is that we need to reform how intellectual property works. And so what's our recourse? Uh, our recourse is to keep it secret. Uh, we can stringently enforce our own protection protocols, just how like the Maori are doing, and even the Aboriginals. Um, I've met some Aboriginals in our, our path toward language reclamation who have entirely offline systems. As Kevin Welch can say, the safest computer is a computer not on the internet. The safest computer is turned off and not on the internet <laughs> in a Faraday cage <laughs> with, the, with, the, with only Kevin knowing where it's at. <laughs> and, so that's just, and so you have tribes actually doing that because they are so worried about sacred knowledge, dangerous knowledge, the next tobacco plant escaping and being exploited and causing millions of people to die of lung cancer. And that exists as a concern among indigenous peoples because we still have this knowledge that has not yet. There are even, are even worse plants out there, even more addictive plants out there that, that have made a conscious decision not to share. Um, and so that's one path, keep it secret. And the other path right now open to us is open source, it, um, which is what, what's happening by default because it's being exploited. People see us record our info public performances and it immediately goes public domain. Um, and so, but I think there is a third way where we can simply work as communities together and create internal databases that talk to each other. And so we can have this protective processes uh, within our own communities and cooperate. And generally, I think we what's called in technical terms, a data cooperative uh, between communities. And, um, and I think that's really sort of enter in the zeitgeist or the spirit of this field of uh, data. Anything I miss, Caroline? This actually was where we were hoping that, that our Maori friends showed up and we were gonna let them jump in and talk about their, their own Wired article. But I think it's open up for Q&A and let's see if you have anything, Caroline. Just maybe if you want to raise your hands, so if you have a question, we can give you the stage or just type it into the. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm normally I'm not very strict on rules, but I'm going to say we have so many people here tonight to try to avoid anarchy. Uh, either type your questions in the chat or raise your hand. I'm going to humbly ask you, just because. Uh, yeah, it could get a little crazy with 65 people. Hey, there is a comment here from Hands that I'm not an IP lawyer. Uh, that might work. But if it's a common, like a good example of a public domain is Black Betty or La Bamba. These are um, stories that kind of went um, mainstream because they're public domain. So it'd be hard to claim the IP of La Bamba because the cat's already out of the bag. <laughs> but your version of it, of course, you can probably claim the IP of. Got a comment here from Josh. Do you want to just say it? Joss Luchu, also hi, Joss. Hey, Michael, good to see you. Yeah. So uh, I'm from Zuni, New Mexico, um, which is one of the Pueblo tribes here in, in um, New Mexico. 
and uh, we have banned um, outsiders. They're, they're welcome to come to the community, my village, but they cannot record, take pictures, make drawings, because in the past, they unfortunately, there have been visitors who have uh, done that and shared it with the outside world. And uh, it's not meant to be shared or it's not meant for others to, um, to copy. And what that has also led to is some of these youth groups like Boy Scouts of America. There's another group in Colorado. They, they copy some of our ceremonies, which is just very disrespectful. I mean, everything it's, uh, you know, they talk about cultural appropriations, they dress in our ceremonial uh, garbs and, and copy our dances, our songs. Uh, they, this is just something that they're not supposed to do, but they did it. And our religious leaders have gone to them and you know, respectfully asked them to stop. So they, my tribe has um, had to make those attempts to these groups. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Josh. Uh, sorry, Megan, I didn't see your hand raised earlier. I think I, I forgot to. Uh, no, no, oh, good. Hey, Michael, hey, Caroline. Hi, everybody. It's so yeah. great to be with you guys. I'm Megan, I'm from Shift 7, and we work on the MIT Solve Indigenous Communities Fellowship that Michael and Caroline were talking about. The thing that came to mind for me is uh, I agree with you um, not to, sorry. You got a quick call just there. Did it pick up? Sorry, my son called me. Um, I agree with you to be very careful on IP. You know, I think that we saw with Facebook that they took all our photos and created deep face with really no permission from all of us. Um, and we consistently see this with big tech. Um, and so I, I think it's, it's really important to um, be very conservative here for a while. And the thing I would offer is I have a bunch of friends who um, have been doing patent and other kinds of IP things. A friend of mine was commissioner of the patent office and others. So there might be some colleagues that could come forward to brainstorm also about certain kinds of protections. I was also thinking a little bit of some of the secure clouds that we have in the country for national security things and whether there's a way for the tribes to work together I think the biggest issue is always infiltration. Someone sneaks in and steals stuff. You know, the, the way that, you know, a lot of stuff gets breached is by somebody who had bad intention. Um, so it's hard, to, you know, to be fully technical in some way to solve it. But just noting that I'm really, uh, I think we have seen very bad behavior from uh, not all, but some of the tech companies in ways that show us their hand. And so, um, whether people intended to do something wrong or they had terms of service that allowed them, but they kind of crossed a line that we might think more ethically versus legally. Uh, legally, probably they had permissions and whatever. I, I can't imagine they broke the law, but they broke the, the cultural, um, for me, certainly, uh, Deep Face does. So anyway, I'll sort of end there, but there's just a couple of thoughts on really aligning. And then the only last thing is just, I'm so thankful for uh, all of the work you guys are doing. And um, I think it's really urgent. Uh, you know, Mary Shelley, uh, who wrote Frankenstein oh, so many years ago said, should, should we raise the monster? And um, I think we do need to bring culture and human wisdom, not just intelligence and smart whatever, it's about wisdom and these things. And so if AI leaves out much of humanity, it's a mistake. And uh, Mary Shelley warned us of this. Um, in the 1800s in that writing. So thank you. Thank you, Megan. Yeah, I think maybe Kevin, maybe we need some sort of EFF and Megan Smith to get some industry and tribal insights together. Cause this is kind of like a- I mean, give, all, give, all, relevant, all, give all relevant people's my emails. I'm, I'm always looking for people to give interesting talks and would love to hear from people with smart ideas on this topic. Then we can maybe convene some sort of work group or something. Um, and I, I guess, yeah, indeed. And I guess just, you know, since, since I'm already talking, you know, I'll just say, first of all, I want, I want to thank you all for the talk. And, you know, it's just, it really makes me think about a lot of these issues that I'm already an activist on, you know, kind of through a different lens and different light. Because, you know, as an activist, I'm used to being 
you know, I have my own beefs with the Magna Carta and the Declaration of Independence and the conceptions of copyright and creative works that it instituted upon the world, though I tend to come at it from my biases of Western culture perspective. I tend to come at it through the lens of focusing on how copyright is used to wall off culture and let certain people enrich themselves instead of culture belonging to the commons and to the people. But I think you raise very interesting ideas of other places it breaks down where, you know, in activist cyberpunk history circles, there's that famous saying, information wants to be free. But, you know, you've made me really think about if that ideal works in all situations, you know, and, and I, I think it's an interesting conversation, and I wonder how we can, in a way, make it so that culture is to be shared and not enriching and profiting a few people, but also respecting when certain pieces of culture matter immensely and deeply to a certain community, and is for them to decide how it is shared, really centering the autonomy of the data in the communities it belongs to. I mean, you know, I... I'm, I'm, you know, it's very distant in the past, but, you know, ultimately I'm of Irish ancestry and I'm well aware of how the British tried to stamp out my people's cultures and, you know, kill their language and their song. And so, you know, these are real concerns that affect communities. And I, I really want to thank you for like making the just kind of glib, let's share everything, fuck the corporations narrative that we see in these spaces, pointing out that that can fail certain communities like indigenous communities and really, we need to come up with a more expansive model that can really serve the needs of all cultures and make sure that they have the autonomy over their traditions. So I don't know if I really have a question, but I just really want to thank you for making me broaden how I think about this issue. Yeah, awesome. No, I, I think um, maybe for a little bit more time, I can introduce a contrarian view of a mutual friend, <laughs> maybe Corey, what he had to say about that. But anyway, I want to get to Dom. I mean, yes, Corey. Corey would potentially have some very interesting thoughts on what you've said here. I think he would be highly respectful and he'd probably have a very interesting counter take. He's a very smart man. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, Dom, I'm sorry. I think uh, hopefully you weren't waiting too long. No, no, not at all. And firstly, apologies. I'm uh, I'm British Canadian, so uh, based <laughs> on the last comment, I I, I, I don't apologize. actually have any. You know, that's like many centuries ago. But you know, at no, the same I, time, I you know, colonialism has hurt all people, including British people, in my opinion. Well, it, it, exactly. And I think that if we can't learn from our past and our history, then how can we move forward with any any sort of purpose? But um, First of all, I just wanted to say that I really enjoyed the uh, the presentation, Michael and Caroline. I thought it was I thought it was great, um, and lots of knowledge there. And as someone that works kind of like in the in the AI industry, for want of a better word, I, I'm particularly interested in ethics. Um, you know, there's been some great uh, shows recently, uh, Netflix, Coded Bias, and and just really demonstrating how the democratization of, of technology like AI can, you know, in some ways enrich people and then otherwise other ways subjugate people. And and I guess my question, what I'm really interested in understanding is, is kind of like what on-ramps are there for indigenous youth and indigenous communities to get involved in, in coding and in the world of AI. So and they do benefit from it. And I was just wondering from Michael, with your experience with some of the big core, how, how can they support indigenous communities? I think very carefully would be the response. I, I think there's a, I know yesterday, I think it was Timnit Gibru and announced that their, her organization who got wronged by um, uh, Google very fairly, or unfairly, I mean, um, is uh, forsaken Google funding. And I, I think there's going to be this, it's tough. I think I'm going to quote Sean Sosi if he's still here, like indigenous peoples don't have the luxury of working only with friends. And sometimes we have to make deals with uh, people unsavory, even English Canadians <laughs> are crows in order to fulfill our objectives. And so I think large corporations who want to work with the business communities need to be conscious that their company will have biases and behaviors that are exploitative. Uh, they're not necessarily, I mean, it's hard to, I don't want to monolithically say big corporations are bad. Uh, big corporations are, are composed of really nice people. 
uh, who collectively may accidentally lead themselves into doing something wrong. Um, so you just have to be very conscious of what you're trying to do. And when you're programming for working within indigenous communities, you just need to have the basic respect of asking permission and being able to accept the answer of no. Um, it, it's like, uh, it's common for tribes. Like I know in the South, there was a uh, Josh, maybe you can uh, interrupt me if I get it wrong. There was a, uh, a sacred mountain with sacred sites on it. That was, and they, the, they wanted to exploit and mine that mountain, but the local people I think there was Zuni, I could be wrong, didn't want to tell them where the sacred sites were. To put, they would have rather the, the sites be destroyed than to have them exploited. And you have this tension of like, they need to keep things secret. Tribes need to keep things, certain things secret. Um, or they would rather let them be destroyed. Um, am I getting that right, Josh? You can nod or say no. <laughs> like, yes. I mean, they have to, they have to be like sacred, respect the knowledge. I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead Josh. Yeah, exactly. There, we we keep certain places uh, secret because they're being destroyed, and you're kind of seeing it with the Bear Ears National um, Monument area. The there's people who are going in the area and destroying a lot of the rock art, the petroglyphs. So we we have to proactively keep some of these sacred places um, secret, and we we don't because we don't want anybody else to know about it. And uh, so that's our way of protecting these areas. And yes, um, there, there's uh, a lot of the sacred places that we have are located on, on uh, either mesas or mountain ranges. Um, and depending on the community, they might feel that if it's destroyed, it, it kind of goes with, um, how should I say, like it's, it's it, it was part of a process because it's always there too. That's the other thing. Um, but there's also other tribes like my tribe where we actively uh, protect certain areas as well. We, we built a, almost like a little fortress for, for our uh, uh, sacred objects on one of our, our mesas. So because it's easily accessible, um, we had to build like a little fortress to protect it from uh, just outsiders, visitors going to the area, because the only people that are um, able to visit are the religious leaders in my community. Thank you. Yeah, the short answer, Dom, is that when you work with the tribe, they're going to have different protocols and processes. Um, and I, I pick on the crow, <laughs> but they are very white friendly, so to speak. And they're more than willing to work with large corporations. And they've worked with Google uh, very successfully, I feel and a partnership to build VR experiences um, a few years ago. And they as a tribe like to make those kind of relationships. My tribe, the Cheyenne, just like Josh's uh, tribe, hate outsiders. And so when you're coming into a community, you have to be aware that there's going to be cultural norms that you might be violating, that they have no interest in working with outsiders. Like you might be saying, hey, here's some free money. And they might say, I'm not interested in it. And that's what you have to deal with. And so getting community support first is important. Anyways, Caroline, do you want to add on to that? I, I just wanted to point out one thing that Josh said that um, might have kind of blown past people's ears is that uh, even within the tribe, there are different levels of uh, privacy and, and restrictions. So you can't you can't just say oh okay so I, I talked to I talked to Josh and he said it's okay so it's fine uh, for everybody uh, but it's actually you know like that sacred area that he just mentioned is only accessible for very specific group of people within the tribe and and not for Josh's sister for example you know. And so, so that's something you just have to keep in mind is um, what we were mentioning earlier with the indigenous protocols, there's very diverse um, protocols and, and um, yeah, approaches, but then there's just this general thing that you can say, it doesn't matter which tribe you're working with, whether it's the Zuni, the Crow, or the Cheyenne, Navajo, it doesn't matter if you approach these people with respect and 
um, everything else just kind of falls into place. Also the patients. <laughs> Nadia, um, you've been very patient. Yeah, Nadia. Oh. <laughs> I was just wondering, like, um, what I find interesting about AI's application in this context is that we don't need to know the language first to, to contribute to getting that ball rolling. But how, how do you get these projects started? How do you get all these people together? Uh, Mary Caroline. <laughs> or get your own, <laughs> I think. Uh, I think she really is the boss. I, I, uh, she makes life easier. It goes back to relations. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> no, I, I, it's really just making friends. Like, I guess from a technical perspective, you need to be lucky enough to know a Navajo data scientist named Sean. That's really helpful. <laughs> he's, I keep making fun of him. He's, a, he's on the line. He's our data scientist. You really do need the, the talent. Um, and also, the, it took a while. We had a lot of false starts. Um, we, we, we feel like we're on a track towards sustainability, fiscal sustainability on this project. Um, but for a long time, we didn't. Like Honestly, until maybe two months ago, that was the state of our project. <laughs> I think um, the hard part is just getting buy-in because a lot of Western institutions don't see this as a issue worth financing, which is unfortunate. And I think, um, and so you need technical talent, you need funding, and you need community buy-in. And as far as the community buy-in, we did everything we usually do. We, we are people who like to make new friends. Um, we, 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 it took a while to make friends with the Quag, the Quag youth. And after we made friends with the Quag youth, we met other Wakasan tribes. And so we just sort of expanded from there. And every step of the way, we had to earn trust. Well, we were demonstrating to them that we had no ill intent. These are what we're trying to do. And first and foremost, what do you want to do? Like what we're not talking about is um, when we were working with them, Macaw, they didn't have a keyboard. So they couldn't even type their own language. What they had to do was either copy paste stuff in the Excel file sheet, or they had to write like this really awkward Unicode code on Windows where you press like three different keys and then you seven. hit like the five. Seven. The seven seven yeah. different key strokes to get one character. And so that became and our highest priority because that was their highest priority. Um, like, and we also explained to them what we're trying to do. Like, uh, yes, we want to build ASR for your language but this is the broader goal uh and so and to make sure they're happy with that maybe they don't want to contribute there are i mean it's just being having respect for communities who maybe don't want to participate in something like that which we encountered there are communities within the waukesha that are, are disinterested or don't see the value and which is okay i mean they, i don't think that's there's nothing negative about that um it's just a part of the process like there's a Anything I'm missing, Caroline? <laughs> I feel like I started rambling there. Um, no, I don't think you're missing anything. Uh, I just noticed Andrea posted a comment. Did you want to say it out loud, Andrea? Also, hi. <laughs> hi. I know that there are a few questions before me. So if you wanted to go ahead oh, and I'm answer sorry. those and then get to me, then yeah, I'll be happy to ask it out loud. Which should we miss? Um, I think Maggie has a question there. Yeah, it helps people. I'm sorry, if you can raise your hand, it really helps because it prioritizes it too. So if you can raise your hand when you have a question. Um, anyways, Maggie. I can read it out loud if uh, Maggie is not currently. Sorry, I'm, it's a little tough, um, but thank you so much for the presentation. Um, yeah, I posted my question in the chat. I think I was maybe a little rambling just even with my typing, but um, I was curious to hear um, if there were just any like different or create like different uses of this ASR for indigenous languages that you were talking about, like that maybe I would we wouldn't have thought of before um, or things that haven't been covered or even things that don't exist yet, but just like things that sound seem exciting or, or interesting. Um, 
kind of things that you're maybe excited about with the potential of the ANSAR for Indigenous languages. Um, and yeah, and again, sorry if I'm misrepresenting or uh, mistaking anything, but yeah, I'm just curious if of any of those kinds of future ideas you have in mind. Yeah, actually, I think um, there is a team I don't know where they're based out. I'm not sure where they're based out, but they're working with a language in Nepal, and there's a, a certain uh, Nepalese. Huh? They're Berlin. based out oh. of Berlin. Yeah, and they're making their VR experience using AI, where you have to interact within this Nepali language in the VR. We try to dig up the link, and that's a really good example of where we're trying to go. And it's not true ASR; it's sort of like a type of. Um, I guess audio recognition. So there's different tiers of ASR. There's like, uh, when you say, hey Siri, uh, that's a real simple type of ASR. It's like a keyword um, recognition. And I think that's what they're doing. Um, and as far as the cool things, honestly, keep a pay attention to the Maori. <laughs> they're way ahead. They're actually building true ASR with the phrase level detection and grammars. And they're even to the point where they're trying to teach new AI. Yeah, which is way farther than we are ahead. We're just trying to get it to recognize a word. They, they're they working on, hey, you said that wrong. <laughs> like nothing, your tone was wrong, or maybe you you, didn't, you, say, you say it too happily or something, you know? No, um, your, actually, your accent is too English, British. <laughs> yeah, so we're, we're, we're just trying to get something that would just recognize that they said a Wakasan word or Kwakwala or, you know, and that's where we're trying to go. And they're already past that. That's like old news for them. That's like, oh, so two years ago, we were working on, making sure that they're pronouncing it a certain way, making sure they have the correct accent and their correct accent. Uh, so Maybe a, a shorter them. answer, Maggie, is that Michael and I particularly are excited about just the different applications that are for learning the language and for applying the language and um, practicing it. And, and um, our journey, as we kind of mentioned at the beginning of our presentation has uh, started with virtual reality and, and mixed reality. And so our, our dream is really to, to get to that point where you can immerse yourself in some environment and, uh, and just, you know, kind of automatically as a side effect, learn and practice the language because you have to speak the language to, to play this game or experience this experience. And while you're having fun, you're also speaking your language. Thank so, you. So Andrea, do you want to ask your question now? <laughs> Thank you for the question, Megan. Sure. Yeah, thanks. I'm always happy to attend your talks. You all are doing some amazing work. Um, but I, you know, keeping up with the language learning and the AI and the machine learning, you know, I do know that our tribe has a linguist that has been working on uh, transcribing hours and hours of elders speaking and pronouncing things. Um, but are there any projects or programs that are being worked on to use as a template for other indigenous communities to use to preserve their languages? Because like my tribe, we have maybe two um, native language speakers left and they're not in a, you know, they're elders, they don't travel, people, you know, don't come into the home anymore. So we're not passing that language on. Um, and I don't know what's being done by the family to, to record or anything like that. Um, so it's, it's this really precarious situation of losing a language. And we're all the tribe of language learners, like you said, and working together as a community with however many, 600 plus tribes across the United States and Northern America is a big undertaking, but it's such important work. Um, and chunking it out just seems to be reinventing the wheel over and over and over. Um, sorry, now I am rambling, um, but I had worked on, um, it ended up just being a small course for Google and Udacity, you know, working on an app to have a swipeable screen between four screens and they used my uh, native 
language of Northern Sierra Miwok, um, our dialect. And it was early stages of me learning my language. So I probably butchered the you know what out of a few of the phrases that I was trying to speak. But you know, it was a step in the direction of preservation. And that's how I marketed it in, you know, when I spoke about it. And I did hear that there were several students who were using it as that. They had their languages that were endangered of being lost and using it for preserving their, their culture, their language and passing that on. So to sum up, <laughs> do you know of any projects that are being worked on that can kind of build on this technology um, for others to use? And thanks again. Yes, fortunately there are a few teams out there. So what we're trying to do is um, it may give the appearance that we're doing this for science's sake. Actually, um, quite the opposite. We are, we're approaching this using the pedagogy of teaching languages that was developed by the linguist we're working with, Colin Quinn. Um, and so he calls it a min course. And so he has this uh, strategy of teaching languages. Uh, and he's actually reawakened sleeping, I think, six sleeping languages, Caroline. Um, I don't know, like a, a, a few languages that using uh, uh, parallel languages or related languages able to reconstruct languages and reignite uh, the flame of these um, these voices and so and so he's over these decades of doing this he's developed kind of like the uh, sort of I guess I would say a triage process of being able to how you quickly bootstrap new language speakers um, and so using that that actually guides our our data collection so what are the key phrases and words that we need to recognize to teach these this minimal course? That's what we're training the ASR with. So we're identifying the words that go into the ASR. And then, so we're defining the how our AI development process based upon the educational uh, utility and necessity. Um, we're just one team. Um, I think a good example Others out there, I keep talking about the Maori, but they're always like good five years ago, ahead of all of us. They have some really interesting uh, apps. Like they, they, so we made Hua Ki'i, which is this object detection system, which I sent the link out there. We'll show the video, it's Caroline is fixing, I'm sure, right now. Um, they actually did that probably a couple of years before we did it. We didn't even know about it, but um, we to give them credit for doing it first. And they are working on educational systems using object detection. Basically, take your phone, take a picture, and they'll give you back a Maori word. And, and we think that'd be building tools like that. Um, and in this one, I'm going to paste this here. So, so Caroline said something earlier that reminded me. The reason why we wanted to do VR was that we were at GDC uh, drinking our free uh, Starbucks coffee from uh, that EA or something. And this young couple came up to us and they had this game and it was called Ruby Ray. And it was an action game. You, you ran around on the phone and it spoke only in Spanish. So the, all the instructions and all the interactions were in Spanish. And at the bottom, there was a little transcription. And so they were saying, go left so to go, they were saying it's in Spanish, that like, go left to go find the red, um, uh, the red key but you had to look down and read it. That became very tiresome. You didn't perform very well if you constantly had to get your the Spanish translated. But after a while, your brain starts interpreting the Spanish and real quickly, like within, I don't play this game for like 10, 15 minutes. I was learning Spanish because I needed to learn Spanish. There was a utility in me learning Spanish because I had to go to the next level. And this is where the idea came from of accidentally learning the language is that if you make it necessary in the experience of the game, they would just, you will learn, you will force yourself. You won't be this chore. Like I, I, I've i been Duolingo in German for probably a good 10 years. <laughs> With, all I can say is, ich bin ein Perihund. <laughs> it's very limited German. But if it's- And if also there's his a, favorite fruit. Say yes, that. Yeah, vas, vas melone. <laughs> Anyway. With an Italian accent because of my Italian yeah. father-in-law. <laughs> well, that's the thing is that uh, I, there was this Italian, her, her sister married this Italian, really cool guy. I really enjoyed hanging out with him. 
I didn't speak Italian. He didn't speak English. Our common language was German. And the most I've ever learned of German was speaking to this Italian because that was the only way we could communicate. And so I think, so we need to create that in VR, that experience of needing to learn the language because you become incentivized and recreating the Italian, I guess, in VR, where you, you want to talk German <laughs> because you need to. But. You know, as, as an avid user of Duolingo, I think you're hitting on the major limitation of it as it exists, where I'm like, okay, I know some French, but I'm in no way able to practice speaking it with somebody who speaks it. So I'm always not going to really be speaking it. Yeah, Kevin, you're breaking up. Maybe if you uh, cut the video. Mm, I, I don't know if it was, in, am I intelligible like now? Frozen. Uh, so we cut over the JP niche desk gadget. So what I said was, uh, I feel good. Da, 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 da. Uh, uh, this is in the uh, Ajutham language. And, uh, and what I said was, uh, I feel good. We, we come from this place. And uh, we're all related. Um, we may not be blood related, but we're all related in this humanity. And so I just wanted to say uh, so, so much uh, respect and thankfulness for Caroline and Michael um, and Kevin. Uh, my name is James Delorme. I'm a member of Clahoose First Nation, um, but my family actually originate from Treaty 4, which is in the uh, Capel Valley in uh, Southern Saskatchewan. Uh, so the Cree is Cinnaboyne and uh, my settler side is uh, Scottish and uh, Icelandic. So Father Hema Kistakuna is go home and kiss the cow in Icelandic. So just keeping, keeping up with uh, the momentum of language here. Yeah, there are some key things that I heard in this conversation. Um, uh, it really important is, is number one, immersion uh, and number two, relationships. And um, so... The, the, I always say that, you know, technology is, you know, 20% and 80% is the relationships we build and how we use that technology in social situations. So um, uh, mine is not a question, it's more of a statement uh, to show my respect, of course, but also um, this was really impactful because um, we have lots of different you know, uh, projects that have taken place within language. I, I'm on the West Coast of BC in Canada. So um, there's a lot of great technology and great work that's taking place. App development, you know, um, immersion. Now we're talking about AI and uh, ASR and, and how that interacts. And so the, one of the key things I wanted to say was that that educational piece on the, at the community level um, is absolutely crucial. So um, I'm pledging to you today that I would like to help support what you're doing and spread the word, number one. And number two, um, let us talk some more so we can, you know, start to spread this to the communities and get this, um, you know, palatable to the right people who are our matriarchs and our um, knowledge keepers to make sure that they, um, they have the ability to, to transfer this, this important work, uh, the languages. So so emot and chatam kwaname, which is uh, we'll see you later. So thank you. Uh -huh. Thanks, James. Uh, I sent you my email. Yeah, also, just... I'm on LinkedIn. Everyone else, we're on LinkedIn, email, and Twitter. Uh, Kevin, you got cut off. Yeah. Oh you know, yes, I just uh, didn't have that much to contribute, but I just also wanted to add that um, first of all, yes, we're it's wonderful to have you, James, and I also just want to say that you know. Um, Anything uh, I can do to boost uh, signals on these efforts, and this is to Michael Caroline as well, in the uh, Digital Civil Liberties Activist communities, I'm always uh, happy to do whatever signal boosting I can. I will in fact share my email in the chat. Anybody here is welcome to contact me if you'd ever like to use our platform to speak or to tweet. I can contact the people at EFF who have a very broad reach about anything you're working on. Especially also, I just want to say um, to all the uh, Indigenous people we have here tonight that um, if there are any issues involving technology in your communities that you're finding is having trouble getting traction in the mainstream press and you'd like to get more eyes on it, we're always happy to try to spread that word and boost that signal. So just consider us a resource and we'll do what we can. Um, and yeah, all I was saying when I was cut off is, yes, I absolutely second that I think using VRAR for the immersion factor is, is vital on these things. You know, as a longtime user of Duolingo myself, 
it's it's very interesting where like I can get to a point where it's like, okay, I can kind of read this language and I can pick out a few words when a speaker's talking, but don't have me try to say it back to them. Like I only when I've actually started having conversations with native French speakers has my French actually started progressing beyond that. And I think ARBR in letting us connect globally with an actual speaker of a language could really go a long way, especially with rare languages like many indigenous languages that except for I think Navajo now are completely unrepresented on something like Duolingo. So yes, to all of us. <laughs> that or you're running from a burning building in a flash as uh, Michael was saying earlier, nothing like utility to learn a language. Hey, Heather. Yeah, so I just wanted to second, reach out to Kevin. He's actually got some very powerful friends. <laughs> he's a very, he's very humble, but he, he knows some very important people out there. In the, I uh, can get, I mean, I can get you in touch with Corey Doctorow, uh, if any of you, and for those who don't know, he's like a rock star in this space, like millions follow his blogs and tweets. So uh, yeah, we, we can get the word out if you have an issue of importance. And he, also cares very deeply and passionately about these issues of justice. So if there's injustice going on involving tech and indigenous communities, he, he will want the world to know about it. Yeah, so thank you very much. And okay, so Ahmed, do you have a question? Yeah, um, <clears throat> so I came a little late. I don't know if you already mentioned this thing, but a lot of, I have two questions actually, there's two parts. <laughs> Part one is a lot of the things you guys mentioned, you mentioned uh, were developed by other groups uh, in the past or similar, how much work is actually being shared? Um, and, and is there a way to for that work that is shared across uh, different groups um, in and outside the community or is it kind of everything uh, kind of self-started? And the second part of the question I'm curious is, I, I also missed the beginning, so I don't know if you mentioned this thing, but why VR from like jumping to VR from the like re creating recordings and education via video, which seems a lot smaller jump. What, um, I'd love to understand a little bit more about the motivation behind jumping all the way to VR and creating fully immersive versus just video. Do you want to take that, Caroline? Do you want to talk about your 70 hours of scanning <laughs> scrapers? Um, I, I guess my, my first answer would be that VR is just one of many tools and I forget who who said that but earlier somebody mentioned that you know there's there's not this one solution and uh there never will be just that one silver bullet and VR is is just something that we have we have high hopes in the immersiveness of VR for um enhancing the language language acquisition and language application. Um, but it's not the only thing. And so uh, part, of, part of our goal with developing the automatic speech recognition is of course, to be able to use that, uh, that technology for, for all kinds of different tools, not just VR. Um, I don't know if that's... I think... Um... I guess maybe with a why VR versus other technologies. And number one, um, it started in Berlin in 2014 and I put on a VR headset and I almost, I squealed and almost peed my pants and threw myself backwards because of a virtual reality VR simulation. And I thought, this is amazing. And we kind of pursued that path, got a small grant, went to Stand and Rock, which is how we met uh, Kevin Welch. Um, the EFF was very interested in that, the Stand and Rock on Pipeline protest. And I strapped the headset to Andrea and Heather, and they can both attest that it gives you, and Jude, of course, so hey, Jude. <laughs> and VR gives you this, there's immense power to transform your perspective and bring you someplace emotionally that you just can't without actually being there. Um, like uh, REI that used to do this thing where you put on a headset, they put you in a canoe at the REI store and they literally slap you in the face with, um, with tree branches and people would squeal and scream, but you're just sitting in the REI store, you know, and there's immense power there to transform your perspective using this technology. And it's coming, 
it won't be the way it is now. It's bulky. You, you strap it onto your head and it, it kind of hurts after about 30 minutes and it gives you a headache after a while. But the, 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 there's, there's, I think there's immense capability to transform your perspective using this technology and also educational uh, capacity. And of course, there's negative uses. Um, uh, there's a game out there that promises to give you PTSD uh, using VR, which is another good idea, I think. I think you can actually give someone a, uh, um, a long, lifelong um, problem that way. But I think there's a good promise. And why VR, why AI is that we're working backwards. Obviously, there's more utility to AI than just VR. Um, so we're hoping to build a platform. You just make the ASR system a API. One of the API clients is VR, and anyone can use anything else. You can make apps. You can use like another type of indigenous Duolingo version like that, uh, so on and so forth. And uh, for us, for me, for sure, it's it was that magical moment of experiencing really good VR for the first time. <laughs> and just like, well, what if we could learn? We could do something with this. This is cool, uh, and it's a it, it, it cause like in education. Uh, I'm now teaching faculty. There's this problem of motivating people to learn something, and it's really hard. Um, and so what you want is intrinsic motivation versus extrinsic. Extrinsic is someone, uh, the, the nun coming over you and slapping you on the wrist to force you to learn French. Or you can put on the VR headset. That sounds fun. I want to do something. And you ride a roller coaster, but you have to learn French while you're doing it. And so that's quite a bit of different motivation processes. Uh, anyway. And, uh, we have a few hands raised, but before we get there, I just, because uh, a couple of things Michael said, uh, reminded me, I just want to say, first of all, yes, um, I can attest to uh, wearing the headset, you know, and feeling like I was with the marchers at Standing Rock. It's a, it's a very powerful feeling. And, um, and just to add on that, yes, we were, we were following the Standing Rock stuff with immense interest just because of the immense issues around uh, immense government surveillance of the protesters exercising their First Amendment rights that, basically looked like, you know, an occupying military regime to be quite blunt about it. But I'm sure indigenous peoples know all about that the uh, U.S. has a disturbing habit of behaving like that. So uh, we were following that uh, with a great deal of interest. And um, I want to suppose one other thing I wanted to say. Oh, it'll come back to me. Um, I did. So either Heather or Alex, I don't know who their hand up first. I, I, I'm going to um, say hello. Um, Michael and Caroline, um, uh, no video. I'm in the other part of the house, but <laughs> I wanted to actually comment a little bit on um, uh, empathy. And so I'm a theater artist and uh, my career has been pretty much decimated. What have theater artists started to do as we're watching our, um, you know, our livelihoods and not just performers or directors, but people that work um, backstage, stagehands, technicians, designers, you know, there is a tension about moving everything into VR. And I feel like <laughs> theater artists have this love-hate relationship with technology to a certain extent, but because of COVID, we've been in this lockdown, what are we gonna do? Well, we're turning more and more to these AR tech and augmented realities and there's a couple of, of like national theaters been doing it in London. And so my point is, is that there's a way that like, it's it's not just about linguistics or, or language acquisition, but the, the idea of being able to be collaborative, cooperative um, in some ways, you know, not culturally appropriating um, what, <laughs> what, what everyone's trying to do in their own uh, preservation, but that uh, there's a lot that theater makers can learn by uh, what's going on with the, the these revolutions in language learning and indigenous language uh, preservation. And so I just had some kind of just like mixed up thoughts around this, you know, that like, how can we preserve, <laughs> you know, possible dying arts um, in, in similar ways. And so that's just, it keeps getting my mind spinning over and over again around, around, you know, what does it mean to preserve things more and more digitally as we, um, move into the future? I don't know if that's evolution necessarily, but it's where, it's where we're going. And, um, as Michael was saying earlier. So anyway, that was just some thoughts that I was having about this wonderful talk. Yeah. 
And I misspoke earlier. I forgot. It wasn't through Standing Rock. It was through Heather. <laughs> Heather was the one where we met Heather. Then they introduced us to Kevin. And then they said, why do you guys talk about your Standing Rock? Stuff? So I wanted to make sure Heather got the proper credit. She was the one they introduced us to, the EFF crew. Uh, thanks for your thoughts, Heather. Um, Alex? Hey. <clears throat> yeah, I guess uh, this is a question from Michael, but I guess you know, anyone in the tech or tribal communities can speak on this. Uh, I was wondering what are your thoughts on sort of multi-tiered access to this information, like community information that we might be putting out. Um, I was thinking, you know, maybe like the more generalized information would be open sourced. Like uh, I do a lot of libraries that I put onto GitHub and I make like some educational YouTube videos on programming. Um, that like generalized stuff seemed like it would be good for the open source and then maybe more specific cultural information shared through apps. Uh, some of that could be public and some of the more sensitive stuff might be limited just to like users who are approved by like a tribal governing body or, you know, the, the exact details might be different based on like the community, but we could, I guess, potentially do something like that. Um, yeah, so it's kind of a deep topic. Um, the, the, so how do we mimic um, systems of knowledge transfer that like um, Josh, I'm really glad he was here, <laughs> I could lean on him, uh, have to access model to their, um, their data. And so how do we mimic that in software? And I don't necessarily have a really strong solution. I, I feel as a software engineer that the code should be open source. Um, unless of course there's a specific reason why you don't want it to be sort like if you're somehow embedding uh, cultural knowledge into the software, then that probably should keep um, uh, proprietary or at least close to the community that's not on an open source license. But as far as the data, I've not, I've been doing my best to, it's really, it's not really like a computer science problem. We have, solutions for security, uh, anything ranging from um, air-gapped computing systems like the NSA or the government does, the DOD, which is the on one side, which you see tribes doing. Uh, like the, the, there's a tribe in Queensland, Australia, that they, they air-gap their computers and their knowledge just because they don't want the information to get out there. Um, or, they, or they don't even digitize it. Uh, I met a fellow uh, through Clubhouse <laughs> uh, uh, last month, he was talking about how his community in India, um, they, they have like a, a minority language in India, but they, uh, they don't want anyone to document it. And so how do you deal with that one on one in communities who don't even want their stuff shared versus communities that closer to the Crow, the like Carolines who are more open about that. Uh, they publish books, I think almost yearly, they publish books about their language which is pretty good, actually. They have a very high speaker rate. Uh, I would not correlate openness with success of the language, but there's a risk of that with the Crow demonstrating that. <laughs> um, well, Navajo have a high speaker rate, and they, they do a lot with their language, too. So, Yeah, and it depends upon the community, too. Like French, no one is going to get insulted if you write a risque play and have Heather perform it in French. But you're probably going to have the Cheyenne mad if you do the same play, a risque play, like the vagina monologues in Cheyenne. I can foresee <laughs> my grandma being mad about that. <laughs> That's not happening. That will never happen. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a difference between uh, French and Cheyenne. Like, it's, so some communities see language as medicine, as like the, the, the very words that you speak. And so, and then you have, you, you have to, it's not really a technical problem. We have ways of security from a software engineering standpoint, a system standpoint, it's really more of a question of policy. Like what kind of governance structure would you have for a large data set that has a heterogeneous access model like what you're describing? And I, I, I don't really have a, my opinion I think is it's, there's a thing called data co-ops where it's basically just sort of like a co-op, a grocery co-op where people own co-own the data and they co-own the governance structure of the, the, the grocery store. 
Um, I think we would be something similar to that. And I feel I don't feel educated enough. But there's someone here who's very familiar with data co-ops. I'd love to chat with you um, because you need to resolve these conflicts of high data uh, entities, communities like the Maori and the Navajo and the Hawaiian versus low data communities or low as share access communities like the Cheyenne. Does that answer, Alex? It's a complex question. For it's not really a technical problem. Like I can't say you need to make sure you, all your if statements uh, use less than. You know, <laughs> you know, it's not it's not that kind of question. Unfortunately, it's not a discrete problem. It's more of a strong, complex socioeconomic historical trauma problem. Yeah, I'd say that uh, that pretty much answered it. I'll definitely be looking into data co-ops now. And I guess I'll just add on that I'm, I'm not an expert on data co-ops, but, you know, as somebody who thinks very much about data privacy a great deal, we, I'll just say that I think we definitely tend to think of this problem in very binary terms, where either data is completely private, uh, either to an individual or an organization, or it's completely public and everyone sees it. And, you know, I, I really do think we need to move we need to move to more toward models where those who have ownership of data also control the access of the data. We, we need to move to a model of thinking about data that, you know, lets people have autonomy over their own data. And if they want to share it with the whole world, let them. If they want to share it with just their community, well, that's where it stays. If it stays with just them, it, it's, we need to get out of this binary way of thinking of data, that it's all private or all public. Um, but, and as Michael says, you know, a lot of that is, getting social buy-in of accepting that, uh, you know, Western philosophy and, and social values are not the only way of thinking about these issues and building systems that, uh, you know, respect that different people have different opinions on this stuff. But yeah, it's, it's not, you know, purely a technical problem. We could build protocols that would do this. It's about also education, which is why we're here. <laughs> and also systems that allow for these different layers of access and um, I'm not sure, is Medina still here? She posted something in the chat, um, which kind of goes in that same direction about intellectual property constraints. Yeah, I'm still Medina. here. Yeah, did you want to ask your question? Yeah, I was just curious. Um, I'm a recent law grad and I spend a lot of time thinking about uh, um, Indigenous legal rights within intellectual property. And I'm just curious to hear from you um, about like what some of, I mean, of course I can kind of imagine what some of the constraints are, but I'd be curious to hear if there are specific um, constraints within the intellectual property um, like framework or like legal principles that, um, that like are sort of urgent priorities in your mind. Perfect, uh, you perfectly. I just found the article, I found an article by, um, you probably know her better, um, Combs, Rosemary J. Combs. He's like a tier one professor in at York University. Are you familiar with Professor Combs? Um, yes, I yeah. Just, I just posted the link to one of her papers. It basically comes down to, and I'm not an IP lawyer, <laughs> I think you would understand it better, is that communal, how communal knowledge gets treated as public domain versus individual knowledge. And so there's this unfair bias toward if you record or if a company like a large tech company um, that created Android, not to name names, <laughs> goes into a community and records audio data of a public performance and then stores that away, you know, so the data, the, since they did the recording, they now own the IP or the recording. I mean, if they share it, then whoever makes the recording, uh, it, it gets out, of course, obviously, but there's that problem of how communal knowledge is treated as public domain knowledge. If there, are, I think, if we had a way for communities to leverage the IP of their own communal knowledge, um, uh, I think that's the critical thing right there. Whereas you would actually enable communities to say, hey, you guys are exploiting our data, um, please stop it um, and have a legal framework. And there is work within the UN, United Nations, and um, to do uh, things like that. But maybe a more question for you though is, is that even feasible? Like, is that like a rewrite of Western law just to enable communal knowledge systems? Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a good question. Like I think um, because uh, BC 
BC is one of the first jurisdictions in Canada to formally um, adopt uh, UNDRIP into domestic legis like Canadian legislation. Um, and that does, uh, that does mean that um, there's certainly more, it, it's a formal recognition of an inter international legal uh, uh, framework uh, for protecting um, Indigenous rights. So um, I, I think that there are a lot more possibilities now than there have been in the past. But I, 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 I mean, my, my honest opinion um, is that I think colonial intellectual properties is fundamentally deficient when it comes to uh, protecting collective uh, indigenous interests um, with respect to intellectual property. So, um, you know, like, and, and of course, like the, one of the challenges is, it, you know, because we're a common law, because in, in Canada anyway, and I mean, the U.S. is uh, similar, um, because, of com because of common law, um, you know, you actually have to bring suit if you want to see see anything change. You have to you have to sue somebody, um, and that's uh, not very practical. Um, but I am certainly very uh, I'm I'm more optimistic than I have been in the past, just seeing the work that that BC is doing. Um, but I I think I will remain cautiously cautiously optimistic. <laughs> yeah, I, I think. Yeah, I, I, I agree too. I think there's some really interesting stuff going on. Like I recently heard that the Library Librarians Association of Canada mm -hmm. was drawn up, like how do we recognize, protect community data too, like within cool. the librarian system. And cool. but it's, and it's sort of, in America, there is this thing called um, NAGPRA. Uh, when the NAGPRA thing happened, uh, Bush won the 1990s Bush uh, President Bush made it a uh, federal policy that um, data stored within federal museum institutions could not be shared without the community's uh, permissions too. And so there have been these movements, these little flutters of green uh, grass poking through the, the industrial complex to mm -hmm. support us. And, but it's a problem that affects not just Canadians and Americans, it's Japan, it's you know Chinese yeah. minority cultures. It's Russian minority cultures. It's German minority cultures who are being exploited. Like the Bavarian, <laughs> I'm sure the Bavarians aren't happy that they are <laughs> the stereotype Germans, even though every other German hates the Bavarians. <laughs> but it's, and you know, I I'll just you know I want to thank you very much for that comment. Uh, very uh, insightful. And um, I just you know a few things I just want to say across this one. Um, you know, I think even in the Western perspective for people from Western ancestry and backgrounds, the current tradition of intellectual property law is very flawed, especially when it comes to the realities of how digital technologies work. And, you know, even for Western people preserving their culture, it frequently has just turned into these walled gardens where a few megacorps get enriched off our shared cultural heritage, and even the artist or creator does not get a say or a share. So I don't really think the current law system works for anybody, including Westerners. So I, I think the whole thing's due for an overhaul. And to your point, really, that really inspired why I really wanted to talk, um, you're, I mean, you're actually right that uh, the the British and therefore Canadian and U.S. common law tradition is fundamentally adversarial in nature. As you said, you, you want to get a case to change the body of common law, you ultimately got to sue somebody. Um, and there are people, even lawyers, who recognize this problem and are working on alternatives. There is uh, actually a friend of mine who is a lawyer and a teacher here, here in Austin named Randy Langford, um, he actually is working on what he calls in his law practice dynamic agreements, which are based out of the restorative justice tradition. But specifically, dynamic agreements are not adversarial in nature, unlike contract law, which is all written by the two people in the contract are adversaries, and the whole contract's written by we're enemies, and this is covering every way you might screw me over. Um, a dynamic agreement is built with the understanding that uh, to breach a contract it may not necessarily be a concept that makes sense over a long time horizon. People change and evolve. Their roles change and evolve. Unexpected things happen. And so a dynamic agreement is written from a collaborative perspective of we are in a conversation trying to establish the shared values that are important while acknowledging that our agreement may change as we change. 
So I just want to say, yeah, you know, I think I think you're fundamentally right that if we really want to fix these problems with intellectual property law as it affects indigenous communities, we need to get away of this Western British common law tradition of the law being fundamentally adversarial in nature. So I just wanted to, you know, share with everybody that there are movements in this direction and people are thinking about this problem. That's really interesting, Kevin. Thank you. No problem. Uh, Heather, did you have another question? Or is your hand just Heather, Heather no, might have I, just I forgot. I took it down. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. What am I sure for you? Yeah. I'm clapping. I'm clapping. <laughs> we're almost out of time. We, I mean, technically we're not because it's my room and there's no time limit. Um, you know, so people can stick around as much as they want. That being said, I realize that it is also going on two hours. Um, if Michael and Carol, I want to get a final question or two, and that's good. I also uh, want to, uh, before we do a final question or two, I want to get a quick sidebar here to just let everybody know that for those who've really enjoyed this and might want to uh, continue socializing or getting to know their new friends in a as social as the digital world allows context, we're well aware that hanging out in Zoom is kind of draining and terrible. Plus we're geeks and love cool stuff. So actually in the chat here is uh, my friend, Michael Furstenfeld, who runs a, uh, an organization called Make Every Media. But he, uh, I'm gonna let him tell you about it, but he has a fun little kind of almost like being in an old RPG sort of online chat room where we can wander around and explore if we'd like to kind of have a virtual happy hour this. So um, I'll let I'll let Michael uh, and, and talk about that and explain that, and then we can maybe add another final question or two before we uh, wrap it up. Uh, Michael, are you there and want to give people the spiel? Well, I'm here, but I think, think you did a pretty good job. It's like uh, being in an RPG. Uh, <laughs> it, it's it, you you can you can you have you get a little avatar and you can walk your avatar around a room. The closer you get to people, uh, their videos will pop up, and you'll be able to socialize with them. Um, self-directed breakout rooms, basically. Um, and have you can I, also- Have I shared the right link here, around, Michael? Is that the right link? Walk around this place, I think so. Let me, I'll check to make sure, but- And this is totally <laughs> optional. We used to do actual going out to the bar after these talks when they were not all <laughs> virtual. And we all know everybody's sick of Zoom meetings. So we tried to find a more fun, creative replacement for virtual happy hours. <laughs> Yeah, so far it's the closest thing we found to uh, hanging out in person that's not in VR, <laughs> a little more accessible than VR, um, but allows you to walk around in a space and be somewhere. Yes, because as, as awesome as VR virtual environments are, we are aware of the accessibility issue that most people do not own a VR headset yet. <laughs> Wait till like Apple releases something. <laughs> that I is the correct. Lucian, yeah. I think Lucian might have left. I was uh, wanting to ask him to to oh. speak up. Um, he had some interesting comments in the chat. I mean, uh, but, if he has already left, uh, if there was a particular question yeah, you wanted to answer, him. I guess you can share it with the room if you thought one of them was particularly thought provoking. Well, it's in the chat. Uh, he was talking about um, about models for low resource languages, and I, I just thought it would have been nice if he if he spoke up. But uh, looks like he had to leave. So sorry. Any yeah, I don't know. Do people uh, want to watch? the video, the Hua Ki video now, or I also posted the link in the chat. You can watch it later on your own. Um, I mean, I think we're video. down to Yvonne, watch it if we can get it working. Yvonne Ooh. demands Yvonne? it, Carolyn. Right. Yvonne right. demands it. <laughs> we, have, we have somebody demanding it. <laughs> okay. and, and also, um, as, as some of you are starting to slowly filter out, I just want to thank you all so much uh, for joining us. Um, we really feel humbled and honored that uh, this many people uh, showed interest in our event. Um, and although really all the credit goes to Michael and Caroline's amazing work, um, I'll just say that if any of you have an interesting topic you would like to chat with the internet about or know friends who are, please get them in touch with us. Um, we really want to highlight interesting things people are doing in this crazy electronic frontier we all live in. Um, and yeah, just thank you all for coming. It is, it's very uh, gratifying and humbling to see this much interest in what we're doing.
but it is not quite done yet. There will be the video and hanging out for anyone who wants it. And hanging out in Gathered Sound. And yes, we really enjoyed the conversation. That was something I, I always miss in, in the usual Zoom events is you have a five minute talk and then five minutes for a discussion and then you're off to the next thing. And uh, this was great to have a chance to actually talk in more depth. Um, hey, the video, but, they're live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we need to get like that Oscar music sharing. for you. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, it is working. Thanks, Kevin. I was wondering. She braces herself to take the image. <laughs> Oma. So if you go to the website, Hua Ki'i, uh, it's open source. You can fork it. You can also create your own glitch. Um, it's, I think it's our vision of sustainable technology. Um, you just take it, you can fork it, and you can create your own language app. All you got to do is change some JSON file, config file, and within five minutes, you can have your own language app, um, object recognition app. So anyways, thank you, Kevin, for hosting this. I think well, I got to feed my wife. She might be, be grouchy at me after I was disrespecting crows. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, if, if, if either of you, after getting sustenance, feel like uh, joining us, you're welcome to uh, join us. But I quite hear the call of food. I might have had my uh, camera off during the talk to take care of that. <laughs> so, but thank you both did, for coming. Thank you both for coming. Well, did we have a food. final question or some oh, pressing? Yeah. Is there any final question? Uh, I'm not seeing any raised hands. No, I'm not seeing any either. Well, it's really great to see both of you. Um, I uh, look forward to the day we meet in Meet Space again, but it's, it is really a pleasure hearing from both of you. Uh, brilliant and fascinating as always. And I, I, uh, I only hope someday to be as impressive a programmer as, as the projects you guys are working on. Um, I keep getting little dribbles of knowledge. It's uh, it's impressive stuff. Well, thank you so much. Thank you everybody for, for coming and for participating um, in these conversations. We had a lot of fun. I hope you did too. <laughs> and uh, for people uh, who want to uh, stick around, as I said, I uh, will at least be hopping in Gather Town for a little bit. Feel free to pop in and stay high. Uh, if you've already had a night of it, uh, we wish you safe electronic journeys and uh, come visit us anytime you're uh, in Austin. We'd, we'd love to uh, meet you and chat. Thank you all for coming so much.